In the ancient Midrash, a rabbi, Rabbi Isaac, asks, Why does God call out to Abraham out of the blue, Lech Lecha, go forth from your land? And in typical rabbinic fashion, Rabbi Isaac answers his own question with a story. This call to Abraham may com be compared, he says, to a man who's traveling from place to place, and he sees a bira doleket, a palace, a mansion, all aglow at night. And the traveler sees that this large palace is well ordered and cared for. The traveler wonders aloud, this palace, this mansion, must have a manhig, a master of the house, to look after and tend to the house. And as if the palace owner read the traveler's thoughts, the owner calls out from a window, I am the owner and builder of this house. It runs well because of me. Isaac compares Abraham to the traveler. He looks at the world and the universe all aglow and orderly and wonders, this world, this palace must have a manhig, a leader. And that is when the owner, the manhig, the blessed Holy One, calls out to Abraham, I am Ribono Sho'olam, I am the master of the universe. Welcome to summer. Time to mix things up a little bit. I often try to take up a theme for the few sermons in July that I do. And so this year I wanted to perhaps bite off more than I could chew and ask some of the fundamental questions that scholars and really we all ask. Kind of, why are we here? How did we get here? And who brought us to this place? So I be, thought I'd begin with the top. Who is God? What is theology? Theology means the study of God from the Greek. And literally describing the words about God is difficult. So I just thought I would tip the iceberg by introducing us to some of the vocabulary and a little bit, I guess, of the sort of historical progression from the ancient rabbis to today. Again, just the tip of the iceberg, giving us some vocabulary, hopefully wetting our appetites to keep coming back. By the way, if you miss a week of these series, don't worry. I'll make sure that they are um, connected, but also stand on their own and hopefully it will increase your curiosity to continue studying. So first and foremost in Judaism, as I just said, God is Ribono Shel Olam, the owner, the builder of the universe. And how splendid is this creation that we see, this Bira Doleket, this world that is ordered, Ma Rabu Ma Asecha, we say several times in the Psalms, how great is this creation? Ribono Sheolam and Rabu are both the same, sort of the fillness. God fills the universe. And as it says in Genesis 1, the world that God creates is tov ma'od. Not perfect, not tamim, but it is very good. And that's where we find the blessings. Next week, I'll talk about actually how God creates. How do we try to imagine that this universe came into being? But the question for us today is, what has God been doing since creation? What exactly is God's nature? We're not going to even touch a little bit on it because it's so fine. We're talking about, again, the master, the one who fills the entire universe, the infinite one. But here is some of the vocabulary, at least in the way we've been able to ask questions and to wonder. First word is providence in English, or hashkacha in Hebrew. You might be familiar with the word hashkacha from a mashkiach, someone who oversees. That's what providence means. 
what has God been doing? How much is God involved in the day-to-day running and working of our lives, the planets, and the universe? Some say God can't be involved in day-to-day. We are too small compared to the infinite one. So it is impossible for God to do that. Another say that there's something called hashkacha klalit. God oversees the general workings of the universe, perhaps in Newtonian and then Einsteinian physics, you know, the rules of the universe, shall we say, but not necessarily in the small details. And then many others say, no, hashkacha pratit. God cares about each and every one of us and each of the small ideas. Nothing is too wondrous for God. All of those answers exist. Which one is it? We will never know, perhaps. The high holiday imagery, of course, hinges on the question of how much providence there is in the world. And we are left to think about it, to wonder, and to ask ourselves, does this influence how we live our life? Many sources consider God, and these are more vocabulary words, omniscient, omnipotent, and beneficent. Omniscient from the sentience, from knowing, wisdom. God is all-knowing. God knows all. God knows what we're going to do tomorrow, what we're going to do in the future. And God doesn't forget the past. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God can do anything God wants, and God is all good. But you might say, why do bad things happen to good people? That is one of the big questions that is always left unanswered. And so we look to biblical and Talmudic theology because the questions are unanswerable contradiction is okay. There are times we're going to say this answer and times we're going to say this answer because it works for us at that time. Yes, God is all good. God is all powerful, but God is also given free worlds, not just to us, free will rather, not just to us, but to the universe in general. The laws of the universe keep working and God is not going to stop them just for us. But what about opening up of the earth, as we read in this week's Torah portion? Where does that come from? The rabbis were clever and said, God wrote those in to the laws of the universe. All of the exceptions that we see, later on the talking donkey we're going to be seeing, have all been written into the laws of the universe. That at one particular time in history, remember God is omniscient, So God knows what's going to happen. This is going to happen. But never again will it happen. Yes, it's contradictory. Why did God answer Korach, but not answer the Jewish people at many other times of need? It's kind of just left out there. The rabbis were okay with the anthropomorphism of the Torah. God certainly has human qualities because God, the Torah speaks in the Lashon of B'nai Adam, in the language that we can understand. And so we have emotions. Emotions are what cause us to do things, or sometimes we have to at least hold on to the emotions. And so that's the same thing with God. If God does something wrong or something to punish us, then God must be angry at us. If something good happens, God must be pleased. That is anthropomorphism, and it was okay. The rabbis of old lived with many unanswered questions. They didn't need to have a systemic theology. You cannot find it in the Talmud. This is what we think about God. People wrote their PhDs combing through the Talmud, trying to find a coherent thesis. and They kind of failed, actually. So in the Middle Ages is when things become a little bit more systemic. The classic Middle Age Jewish theology curriculum includes the writings of Sadia Gaon from the 10th century, 
Yehuda HaLevi from the 12th century, Rambam from the 12th and 13th century, and many others. Their overall goal was to give a rational description to Judaism, to well-educated Jews, tempted by the allure and certainty of Greek philosophy, and yes, by the protection that would be to uh, uh, convert to Islam and Christianity. They wanted to keep Jews in the fold, and so they had to describe Judaism in terms that would keep the Jews. Of course, their philosophies have internal contradictions. Aristotle didn't care about the Torah, but Rambam had to care about Aristotle and the Torah. So Rambam takes on Aristotle's idea of a philosopher king, sort of all wisdom and all wisdom being, and that is God. God is wisdom. And the person who knows God the best is the perfect philosopher who happens to be Moses himself. And people say, because Mo, Rambam's name was Moshe, between Moshe and Moshe, there was none greater between the two. So what is the Torah for Rambam? It's a little bit of a cheat sheet because it allows those of us who are not able to be philosophically inclined to understand God's ways again in our own language. And so the miracle language for Rambam is to help us lonely non-philosophers. But a philosopher really would understand that the miracles didn't happen as they came really radical, that there is some metaphor in the Torah, that not everything is factually truth. The idea that God didn't create in seven 24-hour days was Rambam's first notion. And that was radical for some people. How could you change what exactly the text says? Doesn't it say that? And he says you have to go deeper. And we get to the modern period, which really begins in the uh, 18th century, a little before actually 17th century, with Baruch Spinoza up in the Netherlands. He was excommunicated, but thankfully kind of brought back into the fold. What was he excommunicated for? Because he tried to say, let's imagine God differently than has before. God was imagined sort of as a separate being apart from the universe and humankind. And Spinoza tried to become a little bit what we call pantheistic. God is everywhere. God is inside of us. God is the flower. God is the universe. God is a force in the universe, not necessarily a separate being. And so God literally is written into the nature, the laws of nature. God is kind of nature itself. Yes, quite radical. What he didn't say, at least as far as I know, he didn't focus in on the relationship aspect. Because if you say God is nature, then it becomes, okay, I don't need to be in a relationship. I don't need to think about God at all. Let me get to the 20th century thinkers of Franz Rosenzweig, Martin Buber, Abraham Heschel, and many others who are able to synthesize much of what our ancients did and what you know, a little bit later all we're able to do, Rambam, Spinoza, and the ancients, because it's all just different vocabulary to say, yes, perhaps God is a force for redemption. The, the motivation behind doing good in the universe, the, the blessings in the universe, that is God. The evil in the universe, that is not God. God is the creator, though. God is the creator of the world. Because just like Einstein was able to give us a new vocabulary for physics and to say that there's the other things, we didn't have the word plasma before. We didn't understand that there was a fourth state of matter until the 20th century. So here we have another state of being. Kind of, again, it's, an, it's not an imaginary but it's one that we can't prove empirically, a state of being that we can be in relationship, that if we use our different faculties, usually our mind and our spirit, 
we can be in touch with. We can literally be, have a breach, a covenant with, and say that we do things for the sake of this force, of this being, of whatever you want us to call it, for the sake of this existence that is beyond the empirical world that we call Adonai, that we call God, that we call Ribono She'olam, we can be in relationship. I've given a lot of words today, but hopefully I've been able to sort of take 2,000 years of thinking of people really sort of delving deep into the texts, into our history, and into ourselves to give us just a glimmer of how we can think about our own little puny little selves in this grand universe that we call the Olam and the relationship we have with Bibono Sha'olam. Shabbat Shalom.